Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we resume. Again, for those of you watching who uh, online who perhaps have just turned on, I'm Richard Hudson of Science Business. We are at the Research Strategies Conference in Brussels, and our hashtag for the conference is FP9, as in Framework Program 9. So, thank you all for coming back. Uh, now, <coughs> After some discussion of the Mediterranean diet, now I guess we go to the, nor to the northern diet, uh, um, specifically post-Brexit geometries. Let's talk a little bit about what does it mean, how a, an EU research and innovation program that may not include the two biggest science, two of the three biggest science powers in Europe, the UK and um, Switzerland, that would leave Germany is the, the other one, in. Um, the, uh, that is a mind-boggling question, but there are many possible solutions to it. This also has obviously huge implications, not just for science, but also for innovation and technology. So that's what we're going to discuss here today. For that discussion, I'm delighted to be joined with on our, my, uh, your left, uh, Kay Swinburne, who is a member of the European Parliament from the UK. She is a Conservative Party member, uh, and uh, she uh, it hails from Wales. Uh, uh, with quite a background before her political life in uh, finance of technology and specifically life sciences. So thank you, Kay. Uh, here we have Barbara Herring. Barbara Herring has a multitude of titles. Uh, she is uh, uh, president of the Haute Etude on Administration Publique at the University of Lausanne. She's on the ETH domain, which is the kind of like the governing group uh, of, of the, that various prestigious university. You are also on the, the advisory, the, the, excuse me, the supervisory committee at the University of Geneva, uh, and a professor and an entrepreneur. And as some of you probably know, have been involved in just about every high-level group of EU research for a while. Uh, Wilhelm Kohl, uh, he is the Secretary General of the Volkswagen Stiftung. Uh, the Volkswagen Stiftung is one of the largest funders for research in Europe, uh, foundation funders, uh, uh, with, and not just in Europe, I should say, uh, also around the world as well. And beside him, another foundation. Uh, I guess, Jeremy, you would be the largest foundation By funder far. of research. Yes. For, uh, Jeremy Farrar, the CEO of the Wellcome Trust, which I think it's, what, 600 million pounds uh, a year in research that you do? Uh, about a billion. I, mean, ah, I am really out of date on that. I, I should update my files at some point. Okay. Uh, yes. So, Thank you very much. Now, Kay, let me begin with you. Uh, do you, because uh, unfortunately, you have to dash off to a parliamentary meeting. Uh, funny thing, work goes on when you, despite conferences. So, Kay, do you have any particular solution for this situation we are in? I think what I'd like to do is to, to set the scene. I mean, I've got a science background and I've worked in finance, uh, valuing and, and funding pharmaceutical and biotech companies. So the two businesses I know best uh, are actually global and science is global. So the idea that we actually can talk about this in the context of just the region and not put it into a broader context, I think would be a big mistake. And so when my colleagues start talking about Brexit and punishing and saying the UK chooses to leave, then we have to be very careful that we start considering what that means in a global context. So, I mean, as many of you will know, and some of you in the room probably are, are representative, academics in the UK, by a, by a very large majority, voted to stay, and were very vocal about wanting to remain in the EU. But the referendum outcome is not what they wanted, and so many of them feel the uncertainty right now. They are not in a place that they're comfortable with. But many of the researchers in both commercial entities and in academia in the UK are actually international. They're not British. 
And so they actually themselves have got some serious questions as to where they're going to go next and whether they're going to stay in the UK and contribute to our economy. And so for me, there's, there's a real need to actually understand the global nature of, of the scientific community and the mobility that goes with it. And I think any politicians domestically who mistake that and, and actually think that they can keep them because they can have some rhetoric rather than actions is going to be very much mistaken. So for me, I was asked what the, the biggest risks were of, of Brexit in the short term and what my solutions would be. So the risk short term, of course, is that some of the world caliber research projects that involve UK partners may be put at risk. And whether or not we stay as part of the single market or not, the uncertainty over the next few years as to what that future relationship is, is already going to cause people to start to think whether they really want the British partner in their uh, committee and, and in their group, in their collaboration, whether or not indeed they prefer to have a more stable member states member rather than a British member. So I think it's already happening. And I think that uncertainty is, is not helpful. But there will be also, as well as uh, the, the key things about funding and the Horizon 2020 collaborations and everything else, there's the issue about large institutions, which are mainly scientists moving from a UK base potentially back to another EU member state. So something like the European Medicines Agency, which is based in London and has over 2,000 skilled members of staff, many of whom are actually global in their nature too. So these sorts of agencies with them actually are likely to relocate unless we can find some creative solutions. So I'm going to tell you what my vision is because I can confirm that there is no vision at this point in time. Brexit actually has no sign of what the future is going to be because the analysis is still being done. So there is no hard, soft, scrambled Brexit. It is all open for interpretation. And the results of the analysis, when they come in in the next couple of months, will go to the cabinet and they will make some priorities and make some decisions. So all of you in the room who have ideas and solutions, please bring them forwards now and make sure that your priorities are well and truly heard and that you have evidence behind them because there'll be a lot of voices actually talking at the table. But I think Horizon 2020 and my vision for the future, Horizon 2020 already has a global outlook. It already recognized that the collaborations were important to go beyond the EU and to actually reach out to other countries. And that collaboration brought about synergistic benefits way beyond the cost of funding those projects. And so I think if anything happened to actually put that in jeopardy, whether it be the UK or Switzerland or both of them, it would be a real shame. And I think it would be to the detriment of the remaining EU 27 members. I think we need to maintain a global outlook for Horizon 2020. We need to continue the external focus and actually increase the collaborative links globally rather than actually diminishing them and punishing potentially the UK and Switzerland for some of the decisions their populations have made. I mean, just to, to put it into a nutshell, the problem the UK and, and Switzerland will have will be the entire freedom of movement of people and any restriction on that by many member states is being said is not going to be acceptable to continue actively participating in programs like Horizon 2020. Now if that comes to bear I have a bit of an issue because if you look at the 27 other member states they all have very different ways in which they actually allow the freedom of movement of people. In some countries it's the freedom of movement of workers it's not of people. And there is a big difference in the way that certain member states actually interpret those rules. So I think we need to actually be very careful we don't punish and we actually keep our borders open and our minds open to solutions. But we need a new solution. And I think there are some, some big things that we need to actually consider. I personally believe the UK will continue to invest in the research and innovation budgets across Europe. I don't think there will be any scaling back of that collaborative funding. I also believe over time that the UK will find a way of making sure that they participate in entities. We know that there is no appetite for them to diminish funding to those intergovernmental organizations that operate both within the EU and beyond. So CERN in particle physics, in molecular biology, we've got EMBO, we've got nuclear fission, we've got ITER, and you've got the space agency. You've got all of these that are all funded, not by the EU budget exclusively, but by the governments of the member states and others who fund these organizations. So why can't we use this model, if necessary, 
to actually expand, for example, for the European Medicines Evaluation Agency? Can't the EMEA become a much broader agency that serves not just the EU, but the whole of Europe and maybe our neighbours in terms of drug evaluation? Wouldn't that make sense for everybody in terms of the patients having access to drugs more quickly and cheaper, potentially, if you actually accept that there is one bigger regulator for a bigger region. I'm actually more about finding solutions at the moment because the UK is not going to rerun a referendum. So we have to find a solution. And I know the Swiss are working very hard to find a solution, but I think we need to start thinking much bigger and much broader about the competitiveness of Europe as a region as a whole, not just the EU. And we need to actually look much more broadly at how we might spend the money collectively much better. So on a cautionary note, I would actually say that US, Canada and Australia have got a greater proportion of international scientists employed in their jurisdictions than any EU member state. And they successfully do that with a fairly restrictive immigration policy. So we shouldn't confuse issues here and we shouldn't, make, we shouldn't narrow our thoughts and our, our solutions to a European solution. And I think it's really important that not only the UK, but the EU as a whole and Europe more broadly need to remain open to scientists from across the globe. And they need to be a beacon for talent. And the only way they can do that is to have open messaging rather than actually trying to punish people for maybe having slightly different policies in some areas than others. I think we need to actually reach for where the common ground is rather than closing down the arguments. Okay, thank you. The, um, <laughs> just to come to a few of the specific points, EMEA as a broader agency, I hadn't heard that before. It's my vision. What, what does that Why mean? Why can't it be my vision? The, the, we're speaking of the European Medicine, Medican, Medicines Agency, which is based in Canary Wharf, actually, in London. Um, broader? You mean what? Le, le, have have uh, cl clinical trials from India and Ukraine be involved also? Or? If people are prepared to pay to fund it, they're prepared to adhere to the standards that are required by the EMEA, if they're prepared to contribute to the budget, then why not? Jeremy, what, can I come to you on this? I mean, with your health research interest here. That was earlier than I was expecting. Yes, I know. <laughs> I, I know. Sorry. <laughs> no, just, just this question on, on e, e, a very specific one, on, on moving the EMEA out of London. Is, uh, is this a, would that be very damaging for medical research? Uh, I'm not party to what the future of the EMA is. What I would say is that it is true that the EMA and the FDA and the Japanese authorities are working much more closely collaboratively now such that you can get permissions in one without having to go through all the other jurisdictions. So the, the, the uh, regulatory agencies around the world are working in much, more, in much more better tandem than they were, say, a decade or so ago. Yes, yeah. that is true. Um, and I do think that overall regulation, we need to look at regulation as a driver of innovation and a facilitator of innovation as well as a uh, protector of, of, um, of, of data, etc., which mustn't be lost. But uh, I think it has to be a facilitator of innovation and research, yes. But politically speaking, the, the odds of um, uh, the Dutch or the Italians saying, okay, yes, you can keep the EMA, uh, even though you're leaving. I mean, given the interest that they have in have, taking it, is this realistic? But it's politics, and I think everything is up to, to, to be had and to be gained by others and to be lost by the UK, admittedly. But the other side of this is where well, you have global industries in heavy regulated sectors, and financial <laughs> services is case in point. There are great similarities between the two. If you have a heavy regulated industry where you have a... a at the same agenda coming out of near neighbours, why not be far more inclusive and expansive in the way you're actually dealing with this? And if you're going to lose the UK budget from the EMEA, maybe you need to find other ways of funding it. You don't want to diminish the standards, mm -hmm. therefore why, find, why not find a new model? And why not be open to a new interpretation? Okay, all right. Uh, the, but this raises the broader question, and you referred to it. Uh, you, you, you mentioned participation in multilateral, multinational kind of 
or agencies like EMBL, you mentioned, or CERN, I suppose, is another. Uh, there, there are many of these across Europe. Are we looking at, and I ask all of you, are we looking at the possibility of, a, of European research programs that, with a small e, that is to say, we go back to the days before the framework program? Wilhelm. Frankly speaking, I don't think so. It will not be that the European framework program will become, let's say, a general approach towards research in Europe. But we should keep in mind that, and this morning we already talked about EU as one of the entities and Europe as the wider entity. And that may well offer new interfaces in the negotiations there. And with you, it probably is also necessary to find creative solutions that avoid as much of the damage ahead of us as possible. Uh -huh. Because otherwise, you see, we will really get in trouble. As you were saying, Richard, uh, there are these two strong scientific communities from Switzerland and from the United Kingdom. And if we exclude them, that would do a lot of damage to also the performance of European research in general, because there are so many joint authorships, joint projects running. And the transnational agencies like EMBL or CERN and so on are, of course, um, ones which we would like to even strengthen or to right. even, let's say, broaden in their scope. And I think it's probably a very wise move. What I feel currently is that there is so much talk, as you did, Kay, about punishing and the danger of being punished. Uh, you see, we should keep in mind that politics are not forever, as we can see. Uh, and in my view, if you look back, and I think it may well be worthwhile to look back a little bit, although we're talking about the future, because the past and the present may tell us something. And that is that we have already fallen victim to too much linear thinking. We assumed that Europe and the EU would be a work in progress all along. Uh, they, we wouldn't have to worry about the kind of oppositions. And frankly speaking, we didn't really take seriously the votes in France and the Netherlands in 2005, 2009, even the Irish, you see, those who profited most from the EU, um, having joined the EU, voted against it. But we thought this is just national politics and they are just punishing yeah. their government. But we did not really take seriously that it's also about the EU and how it operates and what it actually means to the citizens. And I think we have to work from there. And that, by the way, if I have... Well, after listening to this morning's debate, I feel, and it was only mentioned once, that the humanities and social sciences in the next framework program should have a much larger portion, not to separate them out, but to use their integrative capacity in order also to teach us more about what is actually going on in society and what needs to be done to also avoid these social divides and lots of okay. other things we are confronted with. Okay, before, before, Kay, you have to go in just a moment. Uh, but before you do, let, let me just uh, ask you, okay, but what about between now and 2019? As you made reference to the, to the damage that's already happening. Should the UK government do more to prevent the damage? Should the Commission do more? I think the UK has, has already pledged that it, it would actually undertake all commitments to 2020. And anything that started before that, it will consider actually giving an undertaking to support. So therefore, there is already a financial underpinning to all of this. The commitment is there to protect science and innovation and to protect, therefore, the competitiveness of the region as a whole. Um, what we need, however, I believe, is, is some certainty very, very quickly. Um, I, I'm not sure I'm going to get it. But I would quite like to have the politicians stop this whole issue about until you invoke this, we won't do that. I would prefer them to say this is a very complicated unwinding of a relationship over decades. And therefore, we continue to work closely together. Let's have a transitional arrangement put in place, agree a transitional period, and then some of this goes away because then we undertake to commit to the budget, we undertake to be good partners and actually fully committed for as long as that transitional period is there, which cannot be two years. It has to be longer. None of these research projects run for two years. They run for much longer periods of time. And so we have to accept that the real world does not work in a two-year time frame. The real world implementation takes a long time. That uncertainty will kill the competitiveness of research and innovation in Europe as a whole if we allow it to prolong without a transitional period being agreed. And what would That's you, my number one priority. And what would you recommend to British universities right now? 15 to 16% of UK research funding comes from Europe. 
what, I mean, at, at Cardiff, what, what are you telling them to do? But in fairness, my, my colleagues on the other side of the argument would tell me that we contribute 14 to 15 percent of the EU budget. So, you know, the money's not going away, the money's available. However we want this, this will be prioritised. Research spending is going to be prioritised in the UK going forwards. So yes, the, the funding from the EU is critically important to projects ongoing and will be for the foreseeable future. But I do believe that we will come to some arrangement whereby we will find a way through this. And we have to. We have to for the sake of our citizens who are looking for a better, more competitive Europe going forwards. And I want it for my children. I want them to know that Europe is a good place to be and they don't have to go like I used to have to go in the 80s over to the US to actually, you know, to take a, a, a big career step in life sciences. Now we have phenomenal life sciences in Europe. I don't want to lose them. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Kay. If you have to take off. Thank you. But let's pick up that theme, though, of, the, of the, how do you deal with the damage that's happening at the moment. Uh, are we managing this correctly over the next three years? This, and I would broaden this to include this risk situation also. Uh, so by all means, Barbara, you join in from your point of view. Well, listening to, listening to uh, Kay, I was very much reminded of the uh, discussions and the chaotic discussions we had in Switzerland following the uh, referendum on the mass uh, immigration. And actually, we got something like a, a transition period. We got an agreement with, with the Commission. The Commission was very helpful in this regard. Um, we have a full association to the first pillar, to the excellence part. Yeah. We, don't, we have an, an access as third country to the second and to the third pillar. And this, so to Which say... Which means you have to pay for it yourself then. Yeah, if, yeah exactly. Okay. But this brought back some security to the research and innovation sector in Switzerland. And actually looking back on these years, the discussions have very much changed in Switzerland. Before, the main argument to participate in the programs was we're getting more back from Brussels than we're paying. That was a very good argument for Switzerland. <laughs> but actually today it's much more and everybody, not only the researchers, the scientists, but also politicians realize it's about the competition. The competition part is the most important for, of course, for a country that is as, at that level as Switzerland regarding research but and innovation. And you've heard it from Lino Guzella, for him yes. clearly for the ETH domain, the competition part, the ERC part is the most important thing. Right, but it is nevertheless, has there been damage to Swiss research? There has been damage in, 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 in the way that Switzerland is losing its attractiveness for high-end research or for really excellent people to come to Switzerland because they fear that the transition period will stop in two uh, Fe a question February 2017. So yeah. th that's the main danger. Money is not the problem. Competition is the problem and attractiveness is the problem. Okay. Jeremy. Yeah, I, I would share those um, views. And, and just, but just stepping back, I, I, I do think everybody in this room and beyond this room who's listening um, and those of us who have any authority over anything, we are at a really critical juncture now, and I, I believe um, we have got a real responsibility to try and get this right. This, this goes beyond one country leaving Europe. or th This has a ripple effect in terms of language that's used, in terms of attitudes, in terms of uh, Europe's place in the world. And I think just at the moment we're going through a phase uh, which is quite worrying in terms of some of that language. So, and I think science and civic society, and I hope philanthropy, I think has got a critical role to play in trying to bridge and tone down. I think we need a calm and long-term, this is about the long-term, this is about mm -hmm. our children as well as ourselves. And I think we've got to try and get this right. If I think about ERC, European, the framework and the future ones we heard about this morning, and I think about that from a British perspective, bearing in mind I've been out of Europe for the last 20 years living in Asia. Uh, one of the key elements of that for me has been this competition that we just heard about. It has helped drive up standards across the whole continent. Uh, it's driven up standards in Switzerland. It's driven up standards in the UK. I hope it's driven up standards in Germany. 
and people have contributed to it and it's helped in building collaborative ventures across the continent. That would be a tragedy to lose that because that's taken many, many years to build that level of trust. And you take years to build up trust and you lose it very quickly. So I think we need to identify as a community exactly what is really critical in these partnerships and relationships and keep hold of those with or without treaties and then be willing to move on other things. Do you see any excuse me, immediate impact uh, on medical research? There's undoubtedly been, the uncertainty is dreadful. Um, if you're young, or you're any age actually, and you're thinking, where am I going to spend the next few years of my life? Where am I going to move my kids? Where am I going to send them to school, etc.? And you've got choices between a relatively stable environment, working in Amsterdam that's going to be part of the ERC for, uh, we hope, forever, and you choose, and then you've got Zurich or London or whatever. You know, I can understand why some people would not make that more risky choice and I think you are seeing that so whatever we do if we could bring a degree of calm stability and security not for one year not for two years but have a transition phase that appreciates that the choices we're making today will have an implication for the next 50 years mm -hmm. okay. and so let's make the right ones not the quick ones okay Wilhelm do you see any impact already um, not yet within the German scene, but of course, uh, when I talk to colleagues in Britain, they are uh, in a, let's say, in a state of uncertainty because of all the not known conditions that will be uh, negotiated in due course. Uh, and as we know from lots of studies, this kind of stability Jeremy just mentioned, or let's say the reliability and what I like to call the high trust culture of creativity is essential if you want to stimulate people to take risks to really embark upon, let's say, the more uh, advanced basic research kind of enterprises. And if you want them to stimulate, uh, to, or stimulate them to go in that direction, then you need a st stable uh, framework of at least the seven years that are uh, let's say, as of the previous framework program, now the time frame. Uh, Nicholas Castrinos and others know that when I was advising the Commission in the 90s, I always put forward, get rid of the four-year time frame because that's too short, you see. You cannot really mm -hmm. operate on that basis. And if you look at the most advanced research funders, like the Wellcome Trust, like Howard Hughes, like us, like uh, the Nordic Foundations, they all operate on a seven to eight-year basis. Even the Max Planck Society operates on a seven-year basis for a director right. to be renewed as a director, not as a member and a, a, a lifetime okay. employee. But I think it's essential that we create as soon as possible, also from British colleagues, a framework that is reliable, and that will be the trick <laughs> which okay, needs to be so done. Okay, what, so what is the framework? Do you have a suggestion on how to solve these problems? <laughs> well, as you know, the, the politicians uh, will put that um, research enterprise as one part of the agenda. So we will not be able to say from the research side it should be done this and this way because the financial implications of all the other areas will play into it. But of course, it would be a clear signal if on both sides, uh, as was just said by Kay, that politicians in the UK as well as in Brussels, as well as the various member states would agree to it that we should keep the research community as a European unit and not as an EU versus the rest of Europe. Well, kind interesting, of thing. Anne Glover uh, in July had uh, s suggested that, that there be free movement of researchers, that it somehow it's a different category of worker. And when she did that at a conference in Manchester, Martin Selmayr, the chief of staff of President Juncker, tweeted back one word, no. Mm. Whoa, okay, that's open debate. Well, yeah. at the same event in Manchester, as you know, yes. our British colleagues were only talking about science is global and the UK is a global player, yes. and they didn't even pay attention to the tensions that under, they undergo or undermine these kind of activities. Yes, okay, but so, but, but so as far as solutions go then? Uh, um... Actually, uh, European research cooperation all, always had two sides. It's on the one hand, Europe for research and science, and it's on the other hand, science and research for Europe. And, and uh, there are different appreciations of these two sides, and I, I think they have to go together. If we focus on, on Europe for science and research, it means 
clearly more money to the ERC. It means widening the ERC, getting other countries into something that may be then an international research Yes, can country. we have a global research council? Well, exactly. there is one, but do they get money? Exactly. Yeah. To, to enlarge, and I think that would be a, a good strategy. I would follow Anne Glover with, with her uh, appreciation of mobility, but then it comes down to very concrete things like pensions and things like okay. that. So that has to be so resolved you, so you, as well. So you're both saying that research is a special, by which I presume we're talking about the excellence pillar, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll yeah. come to innovation in a moment. I will but just mm. add yeah, the, other, the other thing. I think if, 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 if politics takes the other stand, and, and when I was in Berlin two days ago, I, I heard a lot of that talk, that research contributes to Europe. And then you have other problems. Then you're talking about widening, you're talking about EU 13, and you're, and, and you're more talking about collaborative uh, research. And at the end, um, if I add the innovation part and the fact that Switzerland is the most, for, for us in Switzerland, Euro the European Union is by far the most important market. And on the other way around, we're the third uh, important market. So if, if I'm adding that aspect, I would say we cannot just uh, concentrate on excellence and ERC. We have to take it all. It's, it's, a, it's like a, Mr. Eller was alluding to getting married and Frank Sinatra said, yeah, love and marriage. Um, you can't have one without the other. <laughs> so I would mm -hmm. say it's also here. I, I don't see us just going into ERC. We're interested also from a mindset of openness, of culture, of innovation in strengthening Europe as a whole. Okay. So other solutions, Jeremy? Well, I, I am sitting in this audience, which is probably partially linked up with science research in some way or other, it's very easy to talk about how research and science is a special, special pleading. I, I yeah, do does think, anybody want to disagree? Yeah. I, I do think we need to be careful making that, that mm -hmm. argument. Um, there are huge benefits to the free movement of mm -hmm. people and the sharing, and that is true in the creative industries. It's true in science, of course. We all agree with that. But I think we also have to learn some of them and look at ourselves and realize we must talk beyond our own communities and actually appreciate what some of those voices who voted in Brexit and voted in the previous election that Wilhelm was talking about. Because I think we've been too inward looking. We've been too talking to ourselves as a scientific and research community. And I think we've come a little bit divorced from the society in which feeds us. You become viewed as an elite. Us. And you become, there was a dreadful phrase, I won't say who said it during the Brexit, that we've had enough of experts. Yes. That is a, we've got to understand what's behind that statement. And I, I think research and science, if it argues for special case, I think we are going down a worryingly narrow spectrum. Science and research will only thrive when the society in which it's part of supports it. And that's not by making yourself in a silo that's isolated. Okay, but, but, to, but to get into specifics then, if, we're, if you were saying that this back and forth about to what extent should research, the excellence research, be treated differently. So can you imagine a particular new kind of instrument or a new kind of structure for, for this to happen in? Wilhelm, Which, you, you should, raised it first. Yeah, I don't think it's a matter of changing instruments it's much more a matter of who develops a sense of ownership of the next framework program. And will we exclude the Swiss, the Brits and others that, from actually defining the agenda? I think that would be stupid. That was my first question it. that I was yeah? thinking of. So in the high level group, kind, will there be yeah, a Brit? It starts with this kind of activity. Mm -hmm. We will have to have, let's say, open uh, debates on what are the priorities and if the priority setting is done without these people involved and even further uh, you see the non-Europeans if we really want to as you you asked the question this morning about the non-European part of the framework program and the numbers going down it's not a surprise to me if you do not include those people from these other parts of the world, particularly if you are talking about global challenges, to define what the research needs are, particularly as we can experience in, in the Wellcome Trust too, for instance, when you talk about uh, neglected tropical diseases, you cannot do that by simply looking from Europe at Africa and what's going on there. You have to have people from the region, you have to have interculturally sensitive people to do that. And within Europe, if we were to exclude some parts of Europe from 
defining the research agenda in the sense of the foresight activities, the Delphi studies, and also including the citizens. We didn't even talk about that this morning, but uh, I think, you see, if we really want to uh, pay attention to what is possible due to digitization uh, and to the new opportunities of e-consultation, etc. If we were to exclude that, then we would make a gross mistake in the preparation phase. And that is, for me, the first step. Of course, afterwards, then the question arises, what kind of instruments are appropriate to achieve the newly defined objectives? But for that, I think we have an array of instruments which can then be technically sorted out which is the best one to fit the respective uh, collaborations as well as the uh -huh. EU internal kind of things. Um, but there I would say it's a matter of the readiness of the Swiss or the British government or the Norwegian government to actually then pay their share. But I'm sure that these uh, governments will be interested in continuing the collaboration, although on a different mode of operation. Actually, I would not like to change the mode of operation. I would like Switzerland to be full part of, of, uh, of all three pillars and, and, and would fight for financial contributions of Switzerland to all three pillars and not just mm -hmm. for the ERC, even, even though our high-ranking universities, of course, pay more attention to the ERC than to the others. But there are also universities of applied science. There are companies that are working together within the collaborative part. That's important as well. So, wait a minute, Jeremy, I'll come to you just a second. But for those of us who have not followed the Swiss situation as closely, where are we right now? We are almost trying to resolve the question. Uh, having said. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's in Parliament now, yeah. and, and, and uh, we're trying to find a soft interpretation of the, of the pub public vote of February Does 14. the public want you to find a soft solution? I think so, yes. Because there's very different politics in the UK uh, mm -hmm. on, on this. Mm -hmm. You think yes? I think yes, yes. Uh -huh. yeah, and, th and, this is and it would not be the first popular referendum where the impl implementation was soft. <laughs> <laughs> ah, so Swiss democracy is <laughs> goes so far. <laughs> I see. But uh, uh, Jeremy, you were wanting to. So I, I hope that in the discussions coming forward over the next weeks, months, and years, that that all of those involved in it, most importantly in this case the UK, comes with a degree of humility to have those discussions and a, and, a, and, a, and a willingness to work to solutions rather than um, shouting about things. Where I would agree with, with Kay is I think we've got to also though see um, this isn't, we, have, we do have to think more global than just even one continent. It, it isn't actually good enough to be the best in Germany or actually in UK or Switzerland or Finland or wherever now if you really want to change the way people's lives are led and improve their health and improve those economies, ultimately you've got to be competitive at the global level. And, and anything which I think harms that, we need to be very cautious about. We, we need to see this is bigger than any one country or any one continent. And secondly, I think we, I, reinventing instruments will be okay and there may be some need for that, but we already do have some instruments and we've already heard them, whether it be EMBL or EMBO or CERN, these are, these are pan-European and more global instruments that allow us to work in different ways. And maybe we just need a bit more imagination and a bit of humility about the way that those could be framed but to those allow are different partnerships to But be those evolved. are primarily research infrastructures, which is somewhat easier for a ministry to figure out how, you know, I'll take my 2% share. I mean, if you're talking about a research collaborative research project no because that? i think those are mer those margins are being blurred now i mean cern is yes it's an infrastructure wonderful infrastructure um Emble laboratories are wonderful infrastructures but they're also world leading research centers mm -hmm. and so it's a combination of both i don't think to portray them as just an infrastructure investment and you can walk yeah. away from it would be would be fair okay but there are other actors here and i'm i'm uh, have noted, haven't missed the fact that you are both from foundations. Uh, do the role of foundations change then, research foundations? Well, um, <laughs> I believe they're a crucial part of civic society. And as Wilhelm said earlier, politics will come and go. 
we hope that the Volkswagen Foundation and the Wellcome Trust will still be here in 500 years' time, and we can take a longer-term view than a five-year political electoral cycle. What I hope we can do, and we've had uh, extensive discussions about this across all of the European foundations, is find ways that we can work together in a way that demonstrates the collective collegiate nature of Europe in a way that sometimes politicians will move for and move against. But we will be here still in 500 years' time. So, so is, the, is this time. new thinking since the Brexit vote, new discussions? No, it, it started before that, actually, um, not with any thought that Brexit would happen, um, but because I think it's the right thing to do whether Brexit happened or not. Um, I think the great European foundations have a critical role to play in this uh, to bring people together in ways that sometimes can be difficult at a political level. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, just recently we had a meeting of the so-called Hague Club of major European foundations and you couldn't come but you also wrote to me beforehand uh, it's essential that from civil society and foundations I consider as part of civil society, you now bring up even more signals that the civil society is very much interested in keeping the bridges across the channel, but also to the wider world open. And that's, I think, something we are jointly interested in. In fact, we are collaborating with the Bank of Sweden Tercentenary Foundation, the Italian Compagnia di San Paolo, on Europe and global challenges, for instance, with a main emphasis on um, political science, social sciences, and how they address the uh, more uh, global challenges, but also involving non-European researchers. So there are, if you like, also instruments which can be used and picked up by public agencies as well. But the private foundations will have to see to it that they experiment with new modes of operation which can then be transferred also to the national or transnational level by other institutions and that's why let's say on the on the whole of course uh, we are relatively small given the billions spent by the public agencies but nevertheless we can have an enormous influence through showing that change is feasible okay. and that we can experiment with things which otherwise will not be done uh, and that is the opportunity to also bring then finally to the agenda about what should be uh, the next uh, uh, thing to be discussed or to be um, put forward as a research program uh, and say, well, look, at least we have some 20 or 30 or 40 examples across Europe that already work. And I think that is at least my experience, even just within Germany, when you can show, for instance, that even in the very hierarchical German universities, a junior research group leader could have his or her place, that all of a sudden in the late 1990s, this came to an end. And there was this junior research group and junior professorship scheme, and then the legal framework changed and so on and so forth. It's this kind of leverage we have to go for as private foundations, also in this situation with respect to the whole of Europe. You see, we've been investing all along um, unity amidst variety on the common intellectual foundations of a wider Europe in the 1990s. Yeah. And we still continue to do this because I think it's necessary to have complementary activities in the domain of the humanities and social sciences as well as in science and technology. And if we do not integrate these in the next framework program, then we will probably have even more problems in the future. Okay. Well, I, I certainly am going to be very interested to see what initiatives might arise from these foundation discussions mm. then. Uh, but the last question for you, and then to take a few questions from, from you, because I'm sure you have strong views on this, uh, and that is simply, um, it was mentioned earlier a couple of times today, that the international participation, that is from the rest of the world in these programs, has been disappointing. Um, what do you do to change that except throw more money at them? Is there any other solution? For the ERC, I would, I would really try to get other countries, other regions participating as, as, a, as, as there you need a particular approach because you need to, uh, to approach a country and, to, and, to, to, uh, and the countries have to, be, have to be ready to invest even though it's the rule of the winners take it all. So, so that, that there will so be a selection of countries which you have to address. So, for instance, the become. Republic of South Africa, then. Uh, the, yeah, I, Taiwan, all these country, countries are where, where, you, where we have a strong research and innovation uh, system. That I would attract those. I would try to negotiate with them particularly. Uh -huh. 
So I would be more optimistic than your disappointing phrase would have suggested. I mean, I think if you go back into the previous frameworks and you look at the progression of where um, global activities, however you define that, my own area, global health, there's no doubt uh, as that's progressed and it's evolved that those have had a higher agenda within the frameworks through 6, 7, 8, and I, I hope that comes into FP9. Uh, and it's certainly been a bigger play in Horizon 2020 than it was, say, 10 or 20 years ago. So I, I would be more optimistic that that's a trend that will, is now unstoppable. Um, and in fact, as obviously at the moment, with all of the real challenges we face in the next 50 years, it's obvious, um, whether it be my own world of pandemics and emerging infections or climate change or migration or inequalities, or war or conflict, any of those are not going to have, obviously, a single country solution. So Europe, has, Europe is beautifully placed to take on that agenda, and I, I believe it will do. I think it's in a better trajectory than it was 10 years ago, and I hope in FP9 that develops even further. Okay, well. Well, I can immediately follow up because I think what is really necessary if we want, for instance, to get more engaged in Africa, and, and I think we both agree on that, is clearly that we first of all listen to local voices, that we try to develop a pathway of co-evolution and not just simply telling them you should do research on this and this and we know how to do it and you sign here in order to be funded by the same kind of source. Uh, and this is a very complex issue and it takes a lot of intercultural sensitivity to really uh, interact early on so that they can also feel that they are, uh, let's say, developing the concepts themselves with us and not they are just getting the message we want to do this and that. And that's what I meant earlier on also to widen the discourse early on in order to offer opportunities for those areas where you want to embark upon like let's say tropical diseases or whatever you have. Uh, I think it's essential that we do no longer follow this post-colonial attitude, we know better, you sign here. Okay, all right. So at this point, comments or questions from you? Do we have microphones? Yes? Okay. Yes, back there. Please identify yourself. Thomas Jorgensen from the European University Association. Um, I'm, I was hearing a little bit that there was the, maybe the temptation to uh, dismantle parts of the framework program and make it into a much more global and, and uh, uh, flexible EMBL CERN-like -like structure. But politically, given that you can actually hard or soft Brexit, do association agreements with the framework program that's already existing. Is that politically possible or is it even fruitful to have that whole very, very large discussion instead of saying, well, the, the, the simple solution and maybe the political viable solution is let's get an association agreement. It's easily done. We can do that even if we're not in the single market. I, I, we must have heard slightly different uh, discussions because I, I don't think, well, I didn't hear that one was thinking about dismantling whole approaches. That A is impractical, doesn't make sense, and would just add to years of uncertainty and discussion. Isn't it best to say that there is, there's improvements in all of these, and isn't it best to adapt what we've got to a slightly changed world, rather than thinking you're going to set up completely new institutions and structures and systems to make it operate? And it's, I don't believe it's a zero-sum game between a choice of a CERN-like structure or a framework seven, eight, or nine structure. I think you can have both. Okay, but there was a suggestion, not dismantling that went too far, but that there was the suggestion that there would be more such multilateral uh, Well, activities. I would love there to be more global, yeah. Europe to take a global perspective in what it's doing, but I think it's nudging and moving in that direction anyway, so that's to be applauded and encouraged. Okay, another no, but question. But you see, when you look at the companies in the room, and I'm sure they, they will agree with me, they are already Having, setting up research facilities in various parts of the world. It's not that they focus on one place in Europe and they use, of course, the European center in order to have the whole network being organized. And I think that the next framework program will be more global is for me quite clear. But of course, with respect to universities, there's another uh, multi-layer kind of issue which we should discuss maybe at a later t stage today, because you see, then it starts with what do actually the member states do in order to keep their institutions in order? And there yeah. we have a lot of problems uh, across Europe, also in Germany. Another comment question. Yes, right here.
Okay, Walter Luyte, KU Leuven, Belgium. The first speaker who unfortunately left used language like punish. Uh, now, I think uh, it's a bit unfortunate. I can certainly empathize with people who voted to stay and found to their dismay that a larger majority uh, of the UK uh, voted the other way. But there are consequences to, to actions. I mean, if you're not satisfied with your membership of the golf club and you want to leave the golf club, <laughs> then there is a consequence. You know, you can still maybe play golf, but you know, with different conditions. So I get the impression that the people who have voted the other way now try to find so, a sort of way to have their cake and eat it. And you know, I think if the UK wants out because it wants to get under the, the sort of the, the overlording of, of, of Brussels, okay, that's, that's a fair enough choice, but there are consequences to that. And I think that those should be faced also by the people you know, who voted the, the other way. It's a bit unfortunate. Could, could uh, I actually ask just, uh, are you in the room, a little show of hands? Let's have a little vote here ourselves, okay? <laughs> Let, let's imagine that the, that the UK refuses to accept free movement of people. That, that, which seems to be what I was hearing from the Tory party conference. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, would you, you, Brits can't vote here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> would, would, you, would you allow the UK uh, into the framework program? Raise your hand. No. Okay. Didn't even get, uh, would you not? I'm a Brit. That's a <laughs> Oh, that's a clear interesting. Majority. Okay, uh, is there a soft option that we can vote on? No. Not immediately obvious. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but the fact is that y there are already people who are not members of the club and who have negotiated access. So I think it's clear that if the British want access without being members of the club, they could just join that queue and uh, you know pay their dues. And so it's, it's not like we have to reinvent the wheel. There is this option. Some countries have taken this option. No hard feelings, but that is then the consequence of taking that option. So I think that there is a bit of an odd, uh, as I said, te temptation to, as I said, try to have it both ways. And I think that is not uh, consistent. You know, if you make a certain choice, you should then be consistent. About okay, it. uh, yes, about. fast off the mark there, okay. <laughs> You already did say no, Fabrizio. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, let me qualify that. I'm Fabrizio Gagliardi. I'm speaking as an independent consultant. I have double nationality, Swiss and Italian, and I work in Spain most of the time. And I spent 80 years working for an international American company in UK, in Cambridge. So I, I believe I'm a little bit informed. So the thing that disturbed me a little bit in the speech of the uh, member of the parliament, or the conservative member of the parliament, is this kind of analogy with Switzerland. Switzerland is part of Schengen. Switzerland, you can speak any language, including English, and you can pay with euros. Try to do the same thing in UK. Even speak, my English in UK is not good enough. Try to pay euro. And there is no Schengen. I still, when you're, well, Britain is still formally part of the European Union. I have to show my passport. I don't the Swiss or the Italian, but I have to show my passport. I cannot just enter. Yeah. And then when I was, uh, so, you know, So staff, you're not letting them in no, your no, lab. I mean, no, no, the <laughs> point is, as we say, there are consequences. So I think that uh, the, uh, the vote has been a vote and they have to go out now according to the national procedure and then they have to negotiate like anybody else but it's not absolutely the case as switzerland or way or the others okay so okay. some people are leaving the club and they will have to pay the you know the t fees and then next time okay you're back pay. there yes um, ludwig neis is from the university of luxembourg so i i, I think as europeans or continental europeans uh, as they say in britain uh, we should consider what is in it for us um, I, I'm of German origin, uh, but I spent 12 years in Manchester uh, uh, on a chair of cardiology. And it is, uh, in my view, extremely important for European science to have 
the UK in it, not only for the science, it's also for the language and for the mentality. If you work in a European consortium, you will very clearly see um, how they bring to the party a completely different way of discussing. It's not always easy, but um, it is important. And, and the strength in the richness we have in Europe, in the wealth of um, different cultures and mentalities, is as important as um, the science not to speak about the language. Um, of course, the native speakers um, in the consortia will always be better, usually be better in presenting stuff, um, in lobbying for politicians and so on. So all that to say, in summary, um, I, I think we as continental Europeans should really, really uh, tell the UK we need you with all you have to bring to the party in science language and mentality. Okay. <laughs> yes, right there. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the comments. And we'll take one more after that. Go um, ahead. It, clearly, the, the purpose of the discussion, and, and we heard this morning, is... So you are? I'm, I'm Xavier Roth from Birmingham University, okay. uh, looking after European funding. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> an endangered job, eh? Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll be handing my business cards and see the, uh, um, Now, the, the idea, and we've of course heard this this morning, is how can we prepare for FP9? But in the context of Brexit, we shouldn't be thinking too much of how can we take part in FP9 or how can the UK remain part of FP9. As we've heard, is actually there are many ways to actually enable science and scientific collaboration. In effect, what we need to argue for is what are the means for us to carry on with European collaboration? Because that's what matters. It may be FP9, it may be domestic funding, it may be some schemes that we've heard or we've used before, like ERANETS. We've got the foundations that are coming to the fore as well. So, in effect, what Brexit brings is possibly a different way of thinking to enable European collaboration. Now, what we have with Framework Programme is a wonderful programme that is very unique in the world that enables, despite some concerns around the rules, collaboration across borders in such a wonderful, simplistic, I would say, easy manner. But moving forward, we need to think about, in an innovative way for us to carry on collaborating together with FP9, with the foundations or other ways, including domestic funding that will enable us to do that. Mm -hmm. FP9 or not FP9? Okay, one last comment, question from anyone? Yes, go ahead. Right here. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed I you. I just wanted to say, I'm from South Korea, we have a... Um, ah, um, should I... No, just go ahead, okay. just microphone. So, um, I'm from KS Europe, um, South Korean governmental body in Brussels. Uh, I just wanted to say a little word about international um, participation. So now we have seen like tremendous drop drop down in the participation rate of third countries uh, in Horizon 2020. And in that aspect, I want to know just that I hear many people saying that uh, it's important to um, make engaging more uh, third countries in the European uh, research and innovation yeah. projects, but um, necessity is there. But I would like to know if there is any concrete attempt to uh, for palpable process to engage third countries and non-European countries in the area of research and innovation, because oh, does it does it go beyond talk? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, yes. all right. I, and I'm sorry, you, I had cut you off there. Just go ahead. Thanks. My name is Jerry Salol. I'm the chief executive of the European Foundation Centre. Happy to have both the Wellcome Trust and the Volkswagen Foundation as members. I think part of what's being lost in the discussion is this notion that maybe philanthropic, philanthropic resources are there for the long term. And I think at the moment, the reaction to Brexit, and we've been having meetings with our British members, our uh, uh, members in other parts of Europe, uh, as well as in the US, uh, we have US members as well, uh, is actually that maybe this is an opportunity for philanthropic resources to play a longer game. And I completely agree with what was said on, uh, on the platform. But in order to do that, you need to be absolutely reminded that even with the Wellcome Trust's resources, we're talking about swimming pool money. 
and that's the state money, that's the sea money. So the only thing foundations can do really is catalytic things to make examples of things that can be taken to scale. And if that's not remembered, if there's this notion somehow, and I thought I heard an echo of that in your question, can the foundation step in yes. where governments step out? No, they can't. That's the truth. They can do catalytic things. They can do small things. And people need to maybe follow. But the resources are in the states. They are not in the hands of the foundations, not at that scale. OK, all right. Well, would you any final comment before we go off to the workshop very briefly? Um, I, I, I would just say that, that, and I appreciate, and I do carry a British passport, though I wasn't born there, um, and I may have felt it, the anger and the emotion of this. I just think we have to step back and try and move on to a calmer long term and think this is whatever we do for whichever country will have ramifications for many, many decades. And I think we need to be calm in that discussion. And there will be consequences, you're absolutely right, but there will be consequences for them all, I'm afraid. And let's be calm about this. Okay. I think our main interest must be to make these things reversible and not to go for punishment and to just see to it that we really break up because I think that would be a stupid attitude. I can understand the anger and all the emotions, of course, but I think it's really essential that we develop smart solutions and I okay. think private foundations can provide examples. They can provide, let's say, some... Uh, signs of change or they can at least, let's say, provide small things that matter. Okay, Barbara? Actually, the openness and the interest for research, for science and education is a core value of Europe. And I think it's a core value Europe can give to the world and we're discussing what kind of values are still, still uh, 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 valuable in, in our political discussion. So I think it's, we're really at a core and that's also why the aspect of research and science for Europe becomes so important right now. So I would strengthen, I would really strengthen the competitive Champions League. I would try to focus on the collaborative uh, part and I would try to strengthen research in those countries where it's still weak because we need those markets and we need the demand for research and innovation in those countries in Europe. I've seen a couple of countries where there is no demand for research and innovation, and that was quite depressing. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, now, now let's, let, let's this debate get too rough. Uh, the wine has been held until the end of the day, okay? Uh, the, uh, we're going, uh, I should say, by the way, that we at Science Business, as part of our network, will be organizing a working group on, to come up with suggestions on the post-Brexit world. So uh, join the club. Uh, <laughs> the, the entry terms aren't so hard. Um, the, the workshops. Um, the Open Innovation Workshop, as you see, is in the Grand Salon upstairs. The Scaling Up Workshop is in the Folon room, also upstairs. And the Enabling Technologies is in the Ensor room downstairs. See you there.